we all, the three of us, the four of us traveled. And we flew to Rome, and we spent about, I think it was five weeks, six weeks, in Rome, and then we went down to, um, um, well, we went through Positano, but what's the, I can't remember now, what's the, what's the town below? Amalfi, that's where we were. Miracolo a Milano is being shot. Monty and I went up to Milan to meet Vittorio De Sica. It was wonderful to uh, have a few moments in the streets of Milan uh, where some of that was being shot. It was through Monty, of course, and the interest of the Italian directors and producers that we met people like De Sica. I remember an incident in, uh, or two in Rome where we were taken to uh, parties uh, because, of course, uh, Lucchino Visconti was uh, hoping that Monty would make a film for him, I believe. But uh, they would have to take us if they were going to take Monty someplace. So we all went together. And we even, oh, we had a wonderful luncheon in Visconti's beautiful house. And then we were all to go on to this uh, costume party. We, we didn't have any costumes, really, but we stopped under the headlights of a car and somebody burnt a cork, the old thing, we made up our faces and put bandanas and glasses and everything, and we all went to this wonderful dance. But the thing about being with Monty really was that everything was, was height, heightened, and it was always fun, and you always were kidding and uh, laughing, and sometimes at people's expense, but usually it was pretty uh, good-natured. But it was sort of, you felt very, um, special because because we had such a good time together it was at about this time i think that began we began to be aware that something wasn't quite right he some turn began to take place in monty he was a daredevil he'd try anything he wanted to challenge the edge, whether it was death, how close to uh, danger he could come. And somewhere that probably has got a lot to do with what happened to him, maybe. I remember when we were in Firenze, in Florence, it was there that we were staying at a hotel along the Arno, <laughs> and then Monty would get out on the balcony and hang there, literally, six or seven floors above the street that runs along the Arno there. Five fingertips dangling and then pull himself up, literally. He did this from time to time. He would challenge his body to be able to make this sort of daredevil exploit. When we were returning from Italy, we were on the Queen Mary. There was a hurricane or a storm, a very heavy storm at some time. The uh, liner of the Queen Mary had literally made no headway for 24 hours, was just holding its own against in the these very heavy seas and winds. Monty says, why don't we take a terrific picture? I'll go down and get in our cabin. I'll get the porthole open somehow, and I'm going to get a hat and a, uh, and a briefcase and possibly an umbrella. And I'm going to be hanging out of the porthole saying, I'm getting off. I, I just said, I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look. And I, I would refuse to watch because I was absolutely certain he was going to kill himself. I think people that are daring, people are uh, very aware of the fact that it would take a total reverse of the planet to, for them to get hurt, do you know? Or when they get hurt, that is the end, <laughs> do you know? And Monty had that uh, incredible uh, veil of protection around him. At times, he, I would see him almost when he would, he would bang himself or he would somehow injure himself, but it was almost on purpose uh, as, as a defiance against this, uh, this protection he had. In 1950, I met Monty Clift one night at a, at a bar on Lexington Avenue where I went in to see a girl I knew. And uh, he was there. He used to go over to with the owner of the delicatessen there and make him c 
come in with him, this old man, and he'd buy him a drink. And two guys walked in, and one guy was drunk, and he looked at Monty, he walked over, and he gave him one shot and broke his nose. And Monty went flying right out of the chair on the floor, and I fell backwards. Uh, it was unbelievable. It was like a real barroom brawl. And so Monty and I started to talk, and we kind of got friendly. And he called me at work, and we started to s just buddy around, and we had a, a really interesting crew of people that were around us at that time, people like Judy Balaban and Arlene Cunningham. Roddy McDowell came on the scene later, eventually Merv Griffin. I mean, it was a very exciting group, and we literally used to see each other almost every day. I was just turning 18, I guess, and Monty was then 32, and he had just finished making A Place in the Sun. And he was Montgomery Clift, which was, of course, an extremely romantic thing in my eyes. He was very much like an older brother in many ways, because um, he was extremely generous to young people. He was a person who I think all of us who were friends of his in those days and have spoken about that time with him had a sense of him guiding us to the best of ourselves. It was a very special generosity uh, in relationship. We had, uh, had a lot of fun, but Judy was uh, a very close friend, Judy Balaban, and we used to spend a tremendous amount of time together. Uh, I think they were v very close, very much in love at a, at a, for a while. Yes, we were in love. I certainly was very much in love with him. Um, and I think he with me. We, uh, we spent almost a year together seeing only each other. Her father was a very important guy in the motion picture industry. But uh, I, I thought for a while they were going to get married, but uh, I don't think Monty was going to marry anybody. We did, but uh, we did speak about getting married. But um, as I look back on it, when we spoke about it, it was more in a sense of playfulness and uh, the way that you sort of fantasize what, what could become of you both later. Um, I was just turning 18, as I said. Monty was very conscious of the difference in our ages. Monty also, because he was a person who was deeply concerned about choice in life, uh, made me conscious that I really had only begun the process of making choices about my life. And uh, perhaps because I was 18, I thought I knew everything and that if I loved him, I should marry him and that would be that. Um, he, he never said no, but it was clear in the way that we talked about it that, that he was simply allowing me the fantasy, really, in a way. It was clear to me in those days that, that there was a kind of an, an energy inside of Monty that as much as it was responsible for his joy, it was also responsible for something that was on the, on the other side of him. Um, because the role was so much he being the older one, and he being generous to me about guiding me to grow into the fullest part of myself, um, he was very reluctant to share that with me, um, as though it were some sort of burden that he would carry and it was his responsibility. I wished when I got older and we were still friendly, I looked back on the time and wished I had been a little more mature and had understood that a little better, because perhaps I could have given him something more than I did. He was always having to hide. He, le he led a double life, you know. He, he, uh, he went out with women. He had, he had affairs with women, but he also had affairs with men, and he had to keep them very quiet. And uh, I think this was very hard on him. I don't think he liked to hide. And he went and, you know, made very elaborate, elaborate kinds of uh, defenses and protections for this kind of double life. Uh, and he even talked about hating to lead this double life. So I think that was why he was, he was tormented. And he perhaps sought escape in, in alcohol and, 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 and drugs. He had gone to see a psychiatrist and was under some sort of psychiatric guidance, if you want to call it that. And something was happening to him that, well, I 
don't know enough about it, but whether he was seeking help or whether he got the wrong kind of help from his psychiatrist, there's been a lot of talk about that. That might have been be what happened to him. The innuendo was that, that Montgomery Cliff's latent homosexuality uh, was allowed to appear. You know, he was in analysis for many years with, with Dr. Silverberg, who, who was a homosexual himself, um, and uh, who supposedly couldn't help him about that. So it was a, it was a, a difficult and, and, and dark kind of secret for him. And at that time, of course, he was a major, major movie star, hounded by people on the streets everywhere you went. And Monte was a person who didn't go to big premieres. You know, he stayed, his social life was a little less glamorous than that. But I guess because it was Paramount, and my father was then head of Paramount, and we were together, that he decided that he should go to the opening of A Place in the Sun. Uh, because he wasn't seen that much at that kind of thing, the fans around the theater absolutely mobbed him. It was insane. And we were, I mean, the car was almost overturned when we arrived and so on. All right. Uh, I must say, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I suppose one of the pleasures is that uh, I come to an opening night performance of my own, and I don't have to get up there and do it again. So when we got into the theater, it was decided that in order to get us out safely, that we would leave. We were sitting in the loge upstairs, and that we would leave just a bit before the film was breaking so that we could be sort of escorted by these guards out and back to the car. And it didn't work exactly because they saw Monty getting up, and people started swarming again. And it got very much, you know, like a, a sort of a riot. It had a very uncomfortable feeling. We had gone to a restaurant, and uh, we were sitting there talking, and uh, it was quiet. And there was only one other couple sitting in the booth right in front of us. And the girl, very sort of carefully, in, in, in a very unobtrusive way, turned around and, and, and looked at us. And uh, during the course of the dinner, she got went to the telephone. And uh, what had happened is that we were trying to get down to the Italian street fair downtown. And uh, we'd stopped to get something to eat. So we finished the dinner, and we started out, and we got to the sidewalk, and suddenly he said, Ron. And I turned, and I don't know how much, how many people it was, but it seemed as though there were at least 50 people rushing toward us. Well, fortunately, I don't know, you can't get a taxi in New York usually, but there was a taxi. I jumped out, swung open the door, and so one of the cab accepted us because he flung himself in the cab, shot across the cab. I jumped in, slammed the door, and the crowd hit the side of the cab and cracked and broke the window, right? And we found out later, put a dent in the cab. So, of course, the cab driver, he had to explain to the cab driver he wasn't charged for it or anything like that. But it was that sort of thing, you know, trying to uh, keep in touch <laughs> was a, a, a life and death game. And that could very well have been, instead of the side of the cab, it could have been him. He liked to bounce things off of, of people in, in working. And uh, he had worked uh, for years, I guess, kind of, I don't know uh, exactly what their method was, but he had worked with Mira Rostova and bounced things off, I presume, because he had this uh, brilliant mind and theater and acting mind. Uh, but he liked to play with scripts and lines, and, uh, uh, and we became friends. And he started bouncing things off me, these uh, uh, ideas he had for performing. Uh, and I remember um, he was doing a scene uh, as a priest in this Hitchcock film, I Confess. And that was the first time that he asked me to come and, uh, and you know, talk about this uh, a scene he was doing. And, uh, and it was fascinating. He was, to my mind, the best American actor. And it was extraordinary to see how his mind worked. By the time he had made a place in the sun, he was a, you know, one of the greatest film stars, probably maybe as well known as anybody at that time. And it wasn't until Marlon Brando came along shortly thereafter that he had anybody on the same level of stardom. He had a peer when Brando 